So uh, what I want to do today is a little bit have a walk on the PAT world and show, I would say, some screenshots of what chemometrics can offer us within this world. So I will start talking about a little bit the main tasks in PA related to PAT that we can get some help from chemometrics and then I will go in detail in the three main tasks uh, related to this world. So as I mentioned before, if we think about PAT, there are three main pillars that normally we are focusing in, which are process modeling, process control, and productuality assessment. And when we think about process modeling, essentially what we want to do is understanding how the process is evolving, which compounds are being formed. And with this kind of result or this kind of knowledge, we are able to optimize afterwards our processes so that they are developed in the best possible conditions. Then, of course, when it is about process control, sometimes we want to detect some particular stages in our process, like an endpoint, for instance. And sometimes we simply want to be sure that the process is evolving in the right direction. And finally, if it comes for product quality assessment, we want to know which ones are the right physical properties of the product. And we, we, and we very often are focused on composition, but we are going well beyond the classical idea of what do I have in my sample and how much to know other things about like uh, how my composition can get stable in time or how my composition can change in space, how my compounds distribute in my sample. Of course, to do all that, we have different kind of instrumental measurements to, to really monitor and, and understand these, uh, these steps. And we have all a bunch of very diverse spectroscopic sensors that give idea about physical and chemical properties of our, of our processes and products. And also we have simpler sensors that can give us just the value of a single parameter. Of course, many times what we want is putting all this kind of information together, and then it's where we start talking about data fusion, for instance, because using all the sensors together, we will get more reliable answers than if we, do, we just look at each one separately. To do all these tasks that I mentioned, we have many different tools in chemometrics. And if I think about process modeling, for instance, we can divide the tools we have into big families like hard modeling, if we really know the underlying physical chemical model that is ruling our process, model based on, the, on first principles, but most often we use these soft modeling tools. So it is really the variation of the measurement, what is telling us what's going on. For process control, obviously the tool per excellence is the multivariate statistical process control that takes into account many measurements on our process. And if it comes to the product quality assessment, of course, we have many tools to identify what we have, to know how much of the different compounds we have. But again, I mean, we also use some other kind of methodologies to extend in this more elaborate idea about composition. So to study the stability of this composition or to study how our compounds distribute in the sample, how is the heterogeneity of our formulations of our products. Again, if we think about these three kinds of tasks and tools, they are also interconnected. And this means that many times the outputs that come from models that we used in process modeling can be the feeding information for a process control model, for instance. Or sometimes the answer of a process control model is enough to tell us whether our product is on specifications or off specifications. So everything is really related. Now what I will do is passing to explain a little bit uh, some things about these three pillars. I will start with the process modeling. And of course, the first thing I will just mention is the big amount of data-driven tools of soft modeling tools that we have for different purposes. I mean, we have tools for exploring what's going on in our processes like PCA or ICA. If we plot the scores, we can really have an idea about global process trajectories or how the system evolves 
Uh, then, of course, we have all the battery of multivariate calibration methods if we want to predict some key properties, and we can also know how they evolve as a function of the progress advance. And then we have a very, a very nice tool that, well, we like it very much, which is MCR, that in this case, when there is a clear change in your, in your process, we can have from the original process uh, spectroscopic data that we collect during the process monitoring, we can get to know the qualitative information associated to the process in the form of the spectral signatures of the compounds, and we can get as well from the variation of the, of the spectra how these different basic compounds evolve as a function of time or as a function of any other kind of variable that really drives our process. If we think about this last kind of tool, about MCR, uh, many times we put different kinds of information together. This is what we call data fusion in general. When it comes to MCR, we design this as multi-set analysis, meaning that a multi-set is formed by little pieces of information that are complementary to each other. And the typical examples can be what you see on top is this kind of uh, multi-set extended in the raw direction, when we have different sensors that are monitoring the same kind of process. Or if we just put, for instance, information one on top of each other, we have like a single kind of sensor, like a spectroscopic sensor, we can study several batches all together. Or we can study some other kind of measurements, like spectroscopic imaging, for instance, and monitor a process collecting images at different times or at different pHs or at different temperatures. Okay? I will show some examples of those. For instance, in terms of multi-set, uh, sorry, multi-batch analysis, I mentioned that uh, many times the first step in any kind of process implementation is process understanding. And this is just a screenshot of a study that we did on a blending process of a pharmaceutical formulation, and people wanted to know what was the best possible way of blending. And then, of course, they were doing a experimental design, changing several factors like proportions of uh, active principle with respect to excipient, um, how was the loading mode of this kind of blender, how was the speed in mixing, different things that can affect the blending evolution. Of course, every time you do one of these runs, you collect a series of spectra, and you can work with all of them together in the same kind of a structure that I mentioned you before. The result, of course, is, uh, well, in this case, a single set of spectral signatures, in this case, the API and the excipient. And here, I only plotted the concentration profile for the API because it was the critical component. And we can see when we change the different factors in different levels, how these blending profiles evolve and then decide what is the best kind of option to do our blending, for instance. Another possibility, as I mentioned before, is when we want to monitor our process, not just uh, with a single spectrum every time, but collecting a full image in each one of these stages. And as you saw the other day, because there have been many MCR talks on imaging, when you apply MCR to a single image, what you get is, again, well, you have to unfold your image cube into a table of pixel spectra, and the final answer of MCR is the basic spectral signatures, arrays of pixel concentration numbers that you can refold conveniently to recover the spatial structure of the image. So you end up having spectral signatures and the related concentration maps for each one of your compounds. Of course, if you are monitoring a process, you collect several images, and what you can do is just putting them together into a single structure, so you have the blocks of the pixel spectra related to each particular image, and then you will get, as a result, a single set of spectral signatures and the maps that are related to each one of the images that we collected along the, along the process. The result of that is, for instance, if we have a system like this one that we studied with uh, Ludovic in Lille. This was about seeing how a particular um, pharmaceutical com compound could degrade with the temperature. And what we did was just 
collecting a series of Raman images at different temperature values. And in this case, this is what you get as a result. I mean, we could see that there were three different polymorphic forms, and then we were seeing the maps that were going with each one of these forms, and we could see how one of these polymorphs was getting formed from a certain temperature and on, and how the other ones were decaying with the temperature. Obviously, once you have this kind of result, you can get, for instance, something as, as easy as a mean value of per each one of your maps, and this can help you to derive some kind of global thermal profiles associated to each one of these polymorphic forms. Then, another aspect that is interesting when we talk about process modeling is um, the difference between the two big families of uh, process modeling tools. The hard modeling, that means that we know that a certain process evolves following a particular kinetic model or a particular physical chemical modeling model. And in this case, what is done is that actually the model is fitted to the experimental measurement and we can derive some kind of rate constants or useful parameters to really understand what's the chemistry behind the process. Of course, the limitation of these methods is that all the spectroscopic variation that you collect should be well described by the model. Everything has to be defined, otherwise the model is useless. In opposition to this kind of tool, you have all the battery of soft modeling methods, like MCR in this case, in which you, do not, you don't assume any kind of behavior, and then you get really how the process evolves simply from the variation of the spectroscopic measurement. Of course, it's nice because you can model any kind of signal contribution within the process or out of the process, but you don't get these nice parameters that we, we like so much to interpret what's going on. A solution for that is, well, could we sort of mix both approaches together? And the idea is that taking as a basis a soft modeling method, we will use this hard modeling information as a constraint, as an additional information we can put in the modeling. And in this, in this respect, what we do is actually fitting the model to the concentration profiles. But since this is encoded as a constraint, we don't need to include all the concentration profiles related to signal contributions in our model. We can leave some of them outside. Okay? And then we have this kind of hybrid modeling. An example of this could be something, a work that Sylvia Mas did with Jean-Michel some, year, some years ago, and that was a model system that in which they wanted to know how a gel could be formed from a solution of a colloidal, colloidal substance that was called laponite. The idea is that they had the solution, they stopped the steering, and then when you stop that, you go from this more liquid structure into a gel. Okay? These were the NIR spectra collected. We were working with in different spectra because we could see the variation way better. And the idea is that in this process there were happening two kinds of things. On the one hand, there was the gel formation and we wanted to know about the kinetics of this model. But obviously, on the other hand, when you form a, a gel, there are many changes in scattering. Okay? And this also affects the signal that you are collecting. The final solution was this hybrid modeling and what we were doing was using a hard modeling constraint just to model this gel formation and get the related rate constants and leaving the contribution that was related to the scattering out of the model. I mean, that was okay, we were saying it's non-negative, but that was it. And in, this case, and in this way, we could model the interesting kinetic behavior in the presence of some other signal contributions. Now we will go, to, we will pass to talk a bit about process control. And um, many times what we want in this context, of course, is doing data fusion. I mean, we can have many different kinds of measurements that are telling things about our process. And then, of course, I mean, we may aim at detecting a particular stage in the process, like an endpoint, but sometimes we just want to see whether the evolution of the process goes in the right direction. Then, <clears throat> 
Just a brief reminder of the MSPC tool is, the idea is first of all that you should take a bunch of process observations coming from different batches in your process that you know that behave correctly according to your specifications. You can do a PCA to really set the boundaries of what you consider a normal behavior. And then for instance, you can define what is a, let's say, a reasonable residual, I would say, and this is what will mark the limit of your control chart. Then, of course, you can use this principal component model, and when you have new process observations of another batch, you can project, you can project them into this model. And then, for instance, in this case, if you control the residuals and you try to control an endpoint, you will see that the observations in the beginning are above the control limit, but when you reach the end of the process, they go below this control limit, and then it means that you can stop your process. Hmm? Okay. What I will tell about this, uh, this kind of problem is going to be in the context of a PROPAT uh, project, a European Union project where we, where we were participating. And the idea of this project was sort of providing a customized platform for, for end users that could allocate measurements from an NIR sensor, a particle size sensor, and then some other simple sensors like temperature, flows, depending on the process. Of course, what they wanted was a, like a single answer on is the process working better or not, or am I reaching the endpoint or not. Then the thing, of course, is that if you have all this variety, variety of sensors, you can make many different models. Right? You can make from the NIR sensor, you can do PLS models to predict key properties in your process, you can do MSPC models, you can work with your simple sensors and do classical control plots. You have a lot of information, but it would be nice to put all this together. And when we were thinking about data fusion in this context, we said, okay, we usually associate the idea of data fusion to fusing measurements coming from different sensors. But at this stage, we have to think also about fusing outputs of different models, not only thinking about one sensor, one single output. So in this, in this context, data fusion refers to putting together the outputs of several sensors, but also the output of several models that can be associated with the same kind of sensor. So in this framework, we propose that data fusion could be the result of using a single sensor, but putting together outputs of different kinds of models, like models used to predict particular key properties of your, um, of your process, like how viscosity evolves, how moisture evolves. You could also put some kind of uh, like values of MCR profiles, concentration profiles. You can imagine many, many different kinds of models. Or even add to all these kind of outputs, what you would get, like T square or Q, from a process control only defined by this kind of sensor. In this case, what you can do at the end is a global MSPC model that, that takes into account this kind of outputs explicitly and puts them together. Because all those are telling different things about your process. Of course, it is interesting in these kinds of platforms because it means that all the modeling effort that you do is interconnected at the end, so you are not doing extra tasks to get the information of this sensor. And of course, I mean, you compress the information of your sensor, and if you want to store it afterwards, that is much easier than storing the raw measurement. Of course, the same idea applies when you want to connect outputs of different sensors, and then of course, if you have a multivariate sensor, you can get different kind of outputs from different kind of models, and you can join these kind of outputs with temperatures or some other kind of, uh, of sensor measurements. In this case, again, you interconnect not only your model outputs, but also your model sensor, I sorry, your sensor outputs. Yeah? Of course, you interconnect everything, which is interesting, but obviously, since you use these outputs from the bigger sensors, what you manage is that this compressed information balances in size with outputs that can come from simpler sensors that only provide you with one parameter. 
In this particular case, a typical process is a very common one, could be the drying of a product that's, going, that's happening in a fluid as bed, bed uh, dryer. And then what we collect is uh, NIR spectra and some temperatures in the, in the entrance of the inlet air, inside the bed dryer and outside the bed dryer. This is the real picture of that. And what we did was with the NIR, with the NIR data, well, there were some things that were interesting to the, to the partner, like uh, the direct moisture prediction from a PLS model, and just an MSPC model based uniquely on the NIR data. But when it comes to data fusion, what we did was putting together the measurements of these three temperature sensors together with the output of the PLS model and these two kind of parameters that we can extract when we do an MSPC model, which is the T square and the Q. And that was all the information associated with our NIR sensor in a compressed form. So this is, again, in a more graphical way. And the idea is that if we compare the MSPC models based only on NIR or based on this data fusion here, that was to detect the endpoint, the, let's say the difference between points that are far from the endpoint and the endpoint is much bigger, much more clear than if we use just a plain NIR measurement. Okay? Then another aspect that I wanted to mention in this context is um, how we can control the process evolution because the example that I showed you before, it was about finding an endpoint. So in this case, we were just making a modeling, taking measurements connected to the endpoint and we were seeing when we were reaching this stage. But very often we want to know whether our process is evolving in the right direction because if it is not, then we can try to correct for that. The idea is that there are many tools related to this kind of task that what they try is when they have, when we have the full measurements of a particular batch or several batches that are done in, in normal operating conditions, people try to synchronize them just to come up with a model that can be useful to see whether observations of new batches behave following the same kind of, uh, of pattern or not. Well, synchronizing is not always easy, and when you have finished batches, may look more easy, but of course, when you have a new one, which is unknown, it is not an easy task. And well, what we propose is just skipping this step of synchronization, because then you just take your batches as such, and you can do the same kind of thing. So the idea is, again, that I will explain it in the same context as before. So we are now just monitoring with NIR this trying evolution. And obviously, I mean, we can extract information of several batches that happened in a correct way. And obviously, if we put them together to make a model, but we put it in this kind of multi-set mode, we don't need to synchronize anything. Because, I mean, the only thing that is required is that the spectroscopic range is common to all the batches. But the time evolution can be completely different. Obviously, we can do that. We can do our PCA model on this multi-set structure, and we can plot the, pro the process trajectories of each one of the batches. And what we see is that obviously there are differences. I mean, the batches are colored in different, well, are designed in different colors, and we see that some stop before, some other ones stop after. That's normal. I mean, the drying can happen in different ways uh, depending on the day or the lab conditions. But the good thing is that the overall trajectory is the same for all of them. Some start before and then after and the other way around. But there's a common trajectory and we, we are going to take advantage of that, eh, of this common trajectory. Then what we will do to build the model is since we want to monitor the different stages of the process, we are not going to do a single model. We are going to do many local models that follow this kind of global trajectory. So we are going to divide, based on the scores that we calculated, our process observations into, I, sorry, into little clusters that follow the whole trajectory. And we are going to do a PCA for each one of those. So we are going to do many small, oh, sorry, 
many small MSPC models. For each one of these stages, we overlap consecutive st stages to avoid having like voids uh, in the process trajectory that we haven't considered. <coughs> and then when we have a new observation, what we will do is uh, we will project this new observation in each one of these models. And we will display the result in this control chart here, I put, <coughs> sorry, I put a reduced Q value equal to one so that the visualization is easier because it's a common control limit for all the models. And if this is the first spectrum of a good batch, of course, when I project it into my first uh, MSPC model at the beginning of the process, this is below the control limit. That's expectable because we are at the beginning of the process. And this happens for also for the second model, the third, but obviously, at some stage, it will go out because, I mean, we are at the beginning and if we take the process model, the process control models at the very end, our spectrum will be obviously different. Huh? What should happen is when we have a normal observation, at least we should have one or some of these values below the control limit. If we have none, we are in trouble. It means that there is a fail, huh? it's a fault in our process evolution. Obviously, you can do this with all the observations that you are collecting. And what you will see is that obviously, these points in control move because your process evolves. So they are in good control conditions in different, for different stages of the process. If you now collect of the information in this plot, for instance, this is a contour plot. It, what is displayed are Q values. And for each particular observation, you can see that the values in dark blue or red or, or green, sorry, are those values that we found below the control limit. Yeah? So for the first observations, the values below the control limit are related to the first models that we built. And this is moving as the process progresses. Okay. To make easier representations, we can just take, for instance, what is the minimum Q value that we had for each observation and plot it uh, against the, the number of um, local model in which, to which it belongs. And then we can see how, this, uh, how the observations evolve. I mean, this represents the progress of the process. And we can also plot this in the form of a normal process control uh, um, plot, and then just plot the minimum Q value that we find for each particular observation. And in this case, this is showing us that the evolution of the whole process is under control. Of course, if we have a fault batch, what will happen that from a certain point and on, there are not going to be any kind of Q value below the control limit of any local model. Eh? And we will see this in here, we can flag this situation, or if we just plot the Q values, we will see that from a certain point and on, the, the minimum Q value that we, can, that we can get is always above the control limit, meaning that something is going on, something wrong is happening. And finally, I want to say some words on product quality assessment. I mentioned that we can control many, many different things in this context, but I will focus just on one, and is how the composition of our, of, our pro, of our products can change as a function of the space, especially. So how can we study the heterogeneity of our products? Because sometimes it's important that what we produce is well blended, for instance. And then when it comes to defined composition in space, there is a very easy association. Eh? We need to know how composition changes in the sample surface. And if you think about hyperspectral images, what they do is dividing your sample in small spots, eh? small pixels that are looking at small portions of material. And then this is giving you special information and chemical information about the sample. So imaging is the perfect tool to study heterogeneity in your products. Of course, when it comes to define heterogeneity, we can define it in a global way for the whole product. Eh? 
And this means that, for instance, I can take, this is an example of a sample that, in which we have a mixture of these co three compounds, caffeine, acetyl salicylic, and starch. And that would be, for instance, the, the map related to the first score obtained with PCA when we do not center the data. Yeah? So it means that it gives you an idea about how the global uh, properties of your sample sur surface vary. Yeah? You can use this if you want to talk about global heterogeneity, but the good news is that if you use previously a modeling tool like MCR, for instance, you can get maps of each one of your compounds in the sample. And this is interesting because not all compounds mix in the same way. Not all of them are equally distributed. And then you can make studies of heterogeneity, of heterogeneity per compound. This is one of the things you can see heterogeneity at a global or at a component level. But you can also think about heterogeneity in two different ways. And we took this idea directly from the theory of sampling uh, defined by Pierre G. Uh, some years ago and reinterpreted by Kim Esmondson in the recent years. And when we talk about heterogeneity, we can talk, for instance, about constitutional heterogeneity. And this will mean that we look at the different portions of material, here defined by the pixels, and we will see, for instance, for a particular compound, how the concentration is varying between these pixels. Hmm? Are big variations, small variations? And then there is something else. There's another side of heterogeneity, which is the distributional heterogeneity. And this is related to how is my material spatially distributing in the space? Is distributed in a more uniform way? Is it getting agglomerated in some, in some places? So that's something else. Obviously, the kind of tool or the kind of observation that we do is different in each one of these sides of heterogeneity. In the first case, for constitutional heterogeneity, I will look at my pixels one by one, as if they were alone in the world. I mean, I don't care about the relationship with other pixels. But if I want to see how my material distributes, I should look at a pixel and the neighborhood. Otherwise, I will not, not understand that. And you can look at that taking pixel areas, or you can do this kind of task comparing pixels, pairs of pixels, that are at different distances from each other. This means that in the first case, to estimate constitutional heterogeneity, you can just use histograms and see how the concentrations vary in the different pixels. And to do a study of distributional heterogeneity, you should come and use different kinds of tools. Macro pixel analysis is a very typical way to study this fact, but I will also, but I will focus now today more in variograms because it's a different tool and I like it a lot. So in this case, for these three maps that I showed before, I will do the easy thing first. So I will do histograms taking the concentration values of each particular compound in the map and I can see how much scatter I have, meaning how much constitutional heterogeneity I have. The point here is that, for instance, if you look at the histogram of the caffeine in this case and the starch in this case, they are similar in terms of scatter. But obviously, if I ask you which compound distributes in a more uniform way, this one or this one, it is pretty obvious that this one is more uniformly distributed than the other one. Okay? So now we are going to study the other side of heterogeneity. I will do it with variograms, as I mentioned before. And the idea is that to build a variogram, we are representing the variance hmm, of this pixel composition as a function of the pixel distance between the pairs that we compare. So in the beginning, I will do the, well, the, the, com the comparison of the closest pixel, uh, pixel, so, I'm sorry, a pixel with the neighbor. I will see what's the difference in terms of concentration, and then I will make a kind of a mean value for that. Eh? This is if the pixels are separated one unit, but then I will do with two units and so on, three units, four units, until I reach half of the size of my image. Eh? That's the limit in my lack scale. Of course, when I 
represent all this together, if my material is not perfectly distributed, uniformly distributed, what will happen is that pixels that are closer together will show less difference in terms of concentration. And as soon as I'm putting more distance between pixels, this difference in concentration will increase until there is a moment in which it doesn't matter whether I compare pixels separated 16 units from each one of them or much more. This kind of limit is what we call the range. This is telling us the extent of the correlation uh, in, in terms of uh, distribution of material. And the top level is called the seal, and this depends on the constitutional heterogeneity. So if we have more variation, this limit will be up, and if we have less, it will be a little bit lower. Obviously, if we have a look in these three maps, we can see that in this case, for this kind of material, the range is much lower than for the other cases, understanding this kind of concept. And what we will do based on that is uh, presenting an index. That's, I will finish in a couple of minutes. This is the, the variogram that we have for the caffeine, for instance. And if this same material was ideally distributed, uniformly distributed, we would get a random map with the same values. I mean, this is just a randomized map based on these values, and we will get a flat variogram. If we put those together, we can come up with a nice index indicating the uniformity in the distribution, which is obtained by the, co by, by the, co the, by the quotient between the area under this variogram and this other variogram. When we reach the maximum possible mixing, this index is one. Otherwise, it's a percentage over this, this, this one. And in this case, we can say that we reach the 88% of maximum uniformity or the 70% or the 70%. This is an index very useful to control, for instance, blending processes, because we can see, this is with data from uh, Juan Antonio Fernandez, that this is a real mixing and for a particular compound, this is the maximum segregation and we can end up having a nice meeting, a nice high level, more than 99% when we reach this kind of uh, material distribution. And with this, I conclude and I thank everyone who helped in all these kind of works. We have some English speakers, guests, so I will just ask you like a question in English. So just because uh, you you made, you made your, your 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 presentation in English as well, anyway. So, so I have a question about like the imaging at the end. Uh, uh, there is more like the image is more and more of the deep learning technologies around like for for to, to process such images, mm -hmm. and with the emergence as well of this pre treat because the the. the the disadvantage of uh, deep learning is the amount of data required to build the model. However, we have this pre-trained model like Keras or other mm -hmm. ImageNet and anything like that. So it's possible to use uh, even a uh, model trained on cats to process like, uh, uh, any images. And here, we, with heterogeneity, this is something very, uh, it should be very easy to do with deep learning because the deep learning is looking at features, mm -hmm. and then here, you, you, especially in a case of disappearance of features, because the homogeneity is making these features disappear. So have you been in contact with people, or have you had the experience of appli application of deep learning technologies with such imaging? Uh? Well, obviously, I mean, uh, deep, learning, deep learning nowadays is a very mentioned word, mm -hmm. and we can do many things with that. I mean, I, <coughs> I must admit I have no experience, but for instance, for this particular case, I think that a much simpler method can really get to the point. And the idea is that in this case, what we really do is that we based our heterogeneity conclusions on, not on a model previously done, but on the study of the very material that we want to define. And I think in this particular case, I would say that that's a very transparent way to do things because we really get the real maps of each particular compound and based on that, 
we build these indices. But of course, I mean, there's no, I would say, nothing wrong against trying to do these approaches with deep learning and see which kind of additional things we could get. But in this particular case, a simple model solves a little bit the problem that we yeah, have. Of course, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. That's fair, yeah, yeah. fair enough. But it's about like mm -hmm. if you have yeah, the yeah. question is about if you had yes. Heard no, I mean I, ha I haven't tried, but I mean it's is something that of course can be done. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Anna, so, merci beaucoup pour cette belle présentation. Je vais parler quand même en français. <laughs> uh, <rire> C'est plus ma question. Maintenant. Quand tu es dans le contrôle de process, quand tu fusionnes tout à la fin, et qu'il y a, s'il arrive un problème, il faut quand même que l'opérateur retourne à la variable d'origine. Mm -hmm. Comment ça, ça se passe alors euh, Ça c'est, ça c'est plus difficile. C'est-à-dire pour l'instant, eh, pour l'instant, on, euh, disons, on détecte quand il y a un problème, ce qui n'est pas évident dans une euh, observation purement visuelle ou de des paramètres un, un par un. Je ne vais pas mentionner, mais bien sûr, quand il y a une détection d'une anomalie, après, on peut faire des de plots de contribution, par exemple, pour voir exactement quel est le, le capteur qui est plus responsable pour cette déviation. Et ça, c'est une chose qu'on ajoute normalement euh, quand on détecte qu'il y a quelque chose qui ne va pas. Cela dit, euh, ça peut pointer vers euh, quelle est l'origine du problème mais si euh, l'idée c'est de faire un close loop, ça c'est beaucoup plus complexe. Et là, il faudrait d'autres outils euh, vraiment pour euh, indiquer ça. Merci. Merci.